it's been an extraordinary week of news, of legal challenges for former President Donald Trump. And it's been nearly a week since the FBI executed a search warrant on Trump's Mar-a-Lago home in Florida. That warrant unsealed today shows Trump is under investigation for possibly violating the Espionage Act and for possible obstruction of justice. FBI agents were reportedly looking for nuclear documents and carried out boxes of classified information. After the search, Republicans expressed outrage. We now find that justice in America is not equal. It's determined upon whether you want to go after a political a person or not. On Thursday, the attorney general made a rare public statement. Upholding the rule of law means applying the law evenly, without fear or favor. Under my watch, that is precisely what the Justice Department is doing. Former President Trump is defending himself today. In a statement, he said, quote, number one, it was all declassified. Number two, they didn't need to seize anything. They could have had it any time they wanted without playing politics. Of course, something that the DOJ takes issue with. Joining me tonight to discuss this big news week and more, Evan Perez, CNN's senior justice correspondent. And joining me in studio, Robert Costa. He's chief election and campaign correspondent for CBS News and co-author with Bob Woodward of the book Peril. He's also, of course, a former moderator of Washington Week, so we're so happy to have him back in the table. And also we're, we have Phil Rucker, the deputy national editor for the Washington Post. Thank you all for being here. Evan, of course, this is a huge week, a huge moment for our country when we've, we've never seen the home, the residence of a former president search. We're also using words like nuclear documents and espionage act. T talk a little bit about what led to this search, why this search happened, and also what did federal officials obtain based on your reporting? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it's 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 an extraordinary thing for the FBI to take a step like this. And, and I think it's important for people to, to, to sort of understand, uh, despite what the, the former president is saying and his team are saying, which is that they've been very cooperative, uh, the record seems to indicate that there's been some very contentious discussions between his lawyers and the Justice Department that were increasingly getting contentious before we get to this point. And you heard this from the attorney general. They said, he said uh, in, in his remarks, uh, he said that, you know, they were, it, this step was only taken after less intrusive means were exhausted. And those ex less intrusive means were subpoenas. They actually served a subpoena. We didn't know this. Uh, you know, we've been reporting on, on this Mar-a-Lago investigation, these 15 boxes that were taken from the national, by the National Archives back in May of 2021. We've been looking into this, and and everything we've heard from the Trump team was, you know, everything is fine. It, you know, there's there's nothing going on. It turns out they were the subject of a subpoena in June. They the agents went there and retrieved documents that were classified, and then even after that, they they served another subpoena to get surveillance tapes from Mar-a-Lago, and then of course the 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 search that happens on Monday. So. In context, it means that this has been a building, building process before they took this this unprecedented step uh, of, of of doing this search. And of course, today we learned there's nearly 33 uh, a, a list of 33 uh, items here, uh, 11 sets of of documents that were various levels of classification, including top secret SCI. This is the highest level. Uh, this is the stuff that you have to go into special rooms to be able to read in the in the U.S. government. And and Phil, the Washington Post is reporting that some of these documents, your paper, of course, the Washington Post, is reporting that some of these documents are nuclear weapons. We've covered Trump together. But this week seems to have really been a different kind of moment for him. I wonder, what's your sense of this moment, given what we know about former President Trump and what we know about what federal officials obtained? Well, Yamish, uh, what my colleagues at The Post are reporting is that uh, some of the documents that the FBI agents were looking for when they uh, searched his uh, home and private club on Monday uh, did pertain, were classified documents pertaining to nuclear weapons, uh, but we don't know exactly uh, what programs those were or, or, or what the documents said. But the big picture here, uh, as you point out, is it's really a culmination for Trump of, of 
two threads, I would say. He's been fascinated by uh, nuclear weaponry since the beginning of his presidency. It's something he would talk to aides a lot about in private, something he would talk about publicly as well. But he's also been very uh, careless over the years with classified information. He would routinely uh, reveal classified secrets uh, publicly at press conferences to foreign government officials at times. You remember that, uh, that, that dinner he had with the prime minister of Japan early in the presidency at Mar-a-Lago, where he was sort of openly talking uh, about a secret operation. Uh, and, and so this is somebody, a, a president and now former president, who really uh, has had little regard for the levels of classification and the, the, the rules that sort of govern these secrets in the government. And Bob, you're nodding your head. I know you spoke to Ambassador John Bolton today, who, of course, was the former national security advisor under former President Trump. Talk about what he told you and what your reporting has been in this last few hours. Uh, quite a conversation just a few hours ago with the former national security advisor for the former president. When I sat down with Ambassador Bolton, I said, take me back to the room. What was it like when the former president, then president, was briefed by intelligence officials? And he said sometimes Trump would ask for the documents he was given by his briefers, and the briefers would say, sir, probably best for you not to keep them. He said, I'd like to keep them. And I said to Bolton, well, what did you make of that? And Bolton said, well, I was alarmed. Now, Bolton is a Trump critic. But it goes to Phil's point in his reporting about how there was a fear to a point even an alarm at times inside the Trump administration, inside the intelligence community about how this president handled documents while he was president and when he left the White House. But we're still curious as reporters about what was the foundational evidence for this decision? What was in the affidavit that led to the subpoenas and then the search? And Bob, I mean, that, those are definitely threads that we're going to be following. Though we should also talk about the fact that former President Trump is calling this a witch hunt. Um, I have talked to some sources who say, and, and the New York Times was reporting this as well, he's treating this sort of as a PR problem when it's really a legal problem. What are you hearing about the way that former President Trump is dealing with the legal challenges ahead? Well, you saw in a statement a few hours ago, the former president said that he declassified all of these documents. We're not sure yet about the details of whether he declassified documents, how he did so, how exactly this was done. But regardless of classification, this is still a legal challenge for the former president. You mentioned the Espionage Act. The Espionage Act deals with how you deal with defense-related documents, what, regardless of their classification. So he will face legal scrutiny about not just classified documents, but documents related to the national defense as covered by this law, the Espionage Act. And Phil, um, we saw Republicans, a lot of Trump allies, jump to his defense when the, in the moments after the search warrant was, was executed. But we've also seen some staunch critics, of, I should say some staunch allies of former President Trump, sort of shifting their tone. I want to talk about Elise Stefanik in particular. She said that the FBI and DOJ have been, quote, weaponized. But she's also saying, quote, it's important to follow the facts wherever they lead. What does that tell you about the way that the GOP is handling this? They're rallying around him, but also shifting a bit. Why, why do you think he's happening? You know, the, in, the immediate instinct of Republican politicians is to rally around Trump because of his intense popularity within the Republican base. But I think the leadership in Washington realizes that for the FBI uh, to conduct this search, to take this extraordinary step, there must be something serious here, uh, that this is not a game. Uh, and I think they're trying to be careful and not get too far ahead of things, because this could end up being very dangerous damaging uh, for former President Trump. And if you're a Republican official going out there attacking the FBI and defending Trump when, in fact, uh, it turns out that he may have had uh, some really damaging information for the country uh, at risk at Mar-a-Lago, then it endangers your credibility as a leader. Uh, Evan, I want to come to you, which is in, in 2018, former President Trump, he increased the punishment for knowingly removing classified materials with the intent to retain them for unauthorized location, making it a felony. Um, what's the timeline here when you think about sort of what we'll know about how serious this issue is for former President Trump, whether he's going to be charged, whether others may be charged? What do we know? About, what are you hearing from your sources about what could happen here and how quickly it could happen? Well, I, I think we're going to be waiting a little while. Look, first of all, we're about to go into what is known as a quiet period for the Justice Department because we have the midterms coming up. Uh, and under the rules, under the regulations, generally, they try not to, they're supposed to not do things that could interfere with the election. Uh, and we have Merrick Garland, who is the attorney general, and he's absolutely 
going to follow that rule. So I think for a while we're not going to hear very much. Probably what we're going to hear from more is from the, the Trump side, because he, of course, is as uh, as as you guys have been talking, he looks at this in a different through a different lens. Um, one of the interesting things I think you know that that we that we saw from these documents, you notice that the people doing this investigation um, are actually in the Washington field office. Now these are the same people who are also doing the investigation, the FBI office that's also handling the January sixth investigation. So you have to think that a, that this is not a, a an investigation in a in a vacuum. Right. Um, this very well could end up being there could be information. I mean, we don't know, but there could be information that they retrieve from the search that ends up feeding into the other investigation. Um, so the, the former president has a lot of legal issues ahead of him. And in the end, I think they're all connected, to be honest. I think they're going to be connected because they're all having to do with the, the process by which he left Washington at the end of his presidency unwillingly, of course, because he believes he's to, he won, right? So in the end, I think this is all going to be interconnected, and it'll be probably a while before we know the final answer. Wow. I mean, that is really striking and, and very, very important information. Bob, I know you wanted to jump here in here, so I'm going to go to you. With this, I know you were outside Trump Towers, outside in, in New York, when, when Attorney General Eric Garland was making this announcement. Can you talk a bit about what you're hearing about how this might impact former President Trump possibly running for office? We're hearing that he could announce as early as next month. Um, and of course, I know you were nodding your head, so anything else you wanted to add? Yamish, it, it was such a historic week to have someone who almost landed on the Supreme Court, who's known for his low-key personality, Merrick Garland, the Attorney General, step out and talk about an ongoing investigation about a former president and an FBI raid, a search at his home. This is something we just haven't seen in American history. And so it's hard to say exactly how it's going to affect the former president's possible 2024 presidential ambitions, but it's, it's clear that his inner, inside his inner circle, people are urging him to make an announcement, perhaps even before the midterm elections. But some other Republicans, like Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, have been pretty muted about what this all means politically. They know Trump has a lot of political capital in the party, but they too are waiting to see how exactly this plays out and what the evidence is in this probe. And Evan, I'll come back to you. We're talking, Bob's talking about how this might play out. I talked to some people who said the DOJ, um, inside the DOJ, there were people who wanted to see Merrick Garland come out and, and really defend the, the institution and defend themselves. But there are also some people that told me they're a little worried that maybe the DOJ might not have the goods, might not, if, what, what might happen if there might be political fallout here for the DOJ, if Trump isn't charged, if there isn't sort of a more serious second chapter to this. What are you hearing? Take us inside the DOJ. No, I, I think absolutely right. I, I think both of those things you hear, and I think there's a lot of concern. Certainly, I think um, at the Justice Department, they have been attacked by, by you know, these people who work there have been under attack from, from, from Donald Trump Obviously, since uh, he came down that uh, that escalator, right before he ran, before when he was announcing to to run for president, so you do hear both concerns that you could end up. This is this could end up um, ensuring that Donald Trump returns to the White House. Um, in the end, though, I think you know the people who work there, they believe that you know they got to follow the law, they got to figure out whether there's a violation here and whether there's a case that they can bring, not only this one, but also having to do with the effort to impede the peaceful transfer of power. Yeah. Those are two very serious things that they just feel they cannot turn away from. And 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 yeah, I mean, they were very concerned for a while there because the, because the former president had the field to himself for about 72 hours, uh, setting the narrative, saying that there was evidence planted. So they, they, I think, by and large, they viewed that it was important for the attorney general to go out and yeah. say something. And I only have a couple minutes left, but I, we have to talk about two other big things. Trump pled the fifth um, in a separate investigation, Phil. What, what do you make of that? Well, my immediate thought is uh, thinking back to all those political rallies in his campaign when he would mock other people for pleading the fifth, and, and he pleaded the fifth uh, so many times in succession earlier this week in that New York courtroom. Um, look, it, it, it's a sign that he's not willing to cooperate with this investigation into his businesses, but it's a reminder for all of us that he is on legal jeopardy on multiple fronts. In New York for his businesses, in D.C., not only for the use of classified documents, but for uh, the fake elector scheme, and down in Georgia, where the state 
uh, authorities are honing in uh, in a really serious way uh, regarding his handling of the election aftermath there. And Phil, we would be maybe talking about this big bill that Democrats got across the finish line, except that we have all this news to cover. So where does this leave President Biden and Democrats who really wanted to spend this week taking a victory lap? It's a giant question mark, frankly. I mean, this has been probably the best 10 days of Biden's presidency in some time, and yet it's it's been washed out of the headlines because of this Trump investigation. And I think the question for Democrats is, can they build on the substantive accomplishments of this bill uh, to, to message to voters uh, who are very concerned about the economy, obviously, and concerned about a number of fronts as well. So what that looks like in a campaign context after Labor Day when the messages start to hit the airwaves. In the last 30 seconds to you, what do you make of sort of where this is politically with Biden and Trump now in the news? To build on Phil's point, as reporters, I, I think we need to be careful because we couldn't have predicted what happened in Kansas in recent weeks with the vote supporting the position on abortion rights. We didn't see the former president was going to invoke the fifth and then have an FBI search at his home. We don't know what's on the horizon necessarily. We know the kitchen table issues like the economy, always front and center. But in a tumultuous political time like this, I'm holding back on any predictions. Yeah. Well, thank you so much to Evan, to Bob, to Phil for joining us and for sharing your reporting.